Okay, uh, hi everyone. Um, so, um, my name is Aurélien Belay, um, and I'm going to present the joint work with uh, Amory Abra and Marc Sevon. Um, I should say maybe I'm a bit of an outsider in this session. Uh, my talk is going to be more about machine learning than data mining, but I hope you'll enjoy it anyway. Um, the, the title is uh, Learning Good Edit Similarities with Generalization Guarantees. And what we will be doing is uh, trying to learn a string similarity for classification, uh, for which we have uh, generaliza generalization guarantees uh, that, it, that it performs well on unseen examples, but also that it, we have a theoretical um, guarantee that it will lead to um, low error classifier. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, similarity learning. Um, a very common approach in uh, supervised classification um, is to learn to classify objects uh, using a pairwise similarity or a distance function. Um, and you have many successful examples, uh, among them plain nearest neighbors, support vector machines. And uh, as a matter of fact, the best way to get a good appropriate similarity function for your task is to learn it from data. Um, so in our case, we want to learn a similarity function k between uh, uh, pairs of objects um, that imply um, a new instance space uh, in which the performance of a given classification algorithm is, uh, is improved. So it's going to be here, if you start with this instance space, you learn an appropriate uh, similarity function k, and you end up with a new instance space in which, obviously, for example, k nearest neighbors is going to perform better than here. Um, and when you're talking about numerical data, feature vectors, um, a very popular approach uh, is to learn the transformation matrix of a mahler lewis distance of this form. Um, and that is used extensively for uh, improving results in classification and clustering. But in our case, we're talking about strings, so we don't want a, we don't want a numerical uh, similarity, we want a string similarity for string classification. <coughs> and as I said in the beginning, we want it to be guaranteed to generalize well to new examples. And we also want, want it to be to probably induce a low error classifiers for the task. <coughs> so we're really looking at theoretical problems. And in order to do that, we're going to make use of the so-called theory of learning with epsilon gamma tau similarity function from Balkan, and that's what I'm going to explain right now. Um, so Balkan and her colleagues, they wanted a definition of what, what makes a good similarity function, and they wanted it in terms of natural and direct properties, uh, that's the first uh, requirement. They wanted something that includes the usual notion of a good kernel in the SVN theory, but without requiring the uh, positive semi-definiteness. Um, and third, they, of course, wanted that uh, you can derive uh, learning guarantees from this definition. Um, so here's the definition. I should say we're talking, make it clear that we're talking about binary classification here. So we have supervised binary classification. So we have examples and their labels, minus one or plus one. Um, and this definition, uh, it looks nasty, but it is, it is uh, the intuition behind it is quite simple. Um, so we say that a, similar, a similarity function k is an epsilon gamma tau good similarity function for a given problem. If um, So we're going to assume we're given um, a set of what we're going to call reasonable points. Um, I'll come back to that later and explain how we can have this set. But for now, let's assume we're given a set of so-called reasonable points. Right? And what the first condition says here is that most of the examples, so minus, uh, one minus epsilon probability mass of examples, should satisfy this, which is essentially saying that um, uh, your example should be, on average, more similar to reasonable points of the same class with the same label than to reasonable points of the other class. And they should be, they should be gamma more similar, at least. So this, is, this can be seen as some kind of margin. And uh, the second condition is just to say that a uh, tau proportion of the examples are uh, kind of code reasonable. So um, I'm going to give just a very quick and simple example of what is behind the definition. So here we have like a really simple problem with uh, green dots and red dots. We could 
see them as apples and oranges, I guess. Uh, and so we're given the reasonable points here. Uh, it's A, C, and G. Once again, I'll come back later to how we can find them. And if we take a very simple similarity function, which would be uh, minus the Euclidean distance, then we can we can compute uh, these parameters of the definition. So the first thing is that we have tau uh, equal 3 over 8, because we have three reasonable points out of 8 points in total. And if we choose to fix epsilon to 0 here, uh, that means that all points should respect the gamma margin that we have. And then we can compute, actually, this margin in here is 0 0.03. Um, but of course, you could choose to ignore a point. So just say that seven, only seven points respects the, the, the proposed margin. So you ignore this point, for example, and you can get a better margin. Okay, so that's the idea. I hope you got the, the intuition. And so this is all nice, but what, are, what can we do uh, with that? Um, what we're going to do next, if we have such a similarity function that respects the definition, is to uh, use the similarity function, the similarity scores to the reasonable points as features. So we're going to build that new instance space I was talking about earlier. So here you have G, C, and A that were all reasonable points. And so you just construct this new instance space where the features are the similarity scores. And what uh, Balkan tells us about this is that so if we respect the definition, if or k is epsilon gamma tau good, then we have in this space a linear separator alpha, uh, uh, so a hyperplane basically that uh, that has error close to epsilon and margin gamma. So if we fulfill the definition, we know we there's a there's a low error classifier in there, and. The good news is that we can also learn it efficiently using a pretty simple linear program where on the left hand side we're trying to uh, minimize the margin violations and here we're just regularizing with a L1 norm. This looks very much like a YNOM SVM. And so I told you I would come back to the reasonable points uh, and actually thanks to this L1 regularization we're going to be able to automatically uh, select among the training examples, the points that are going to serve as reasonable points in our case. Um, and I don't know if you're familiar with this, probably most of you are, but uh, <coughs> I know about the effect of uh, L1 norm constraint or regularization on sparsity, but essentially, this is a small uh, geometric interpretation, um, where so you're trying to uh, optimize that blue function here uh, while being satisfying the constraint. Here it's the L2 constraint, L1 constraint. And while with the L2 constraint, you're going to pretty much hit the ball at any place. Uh, in the L1 case, you're going to be attracted by the edges. Um, and you will end up zero out a lot of coordinates in your, in your vector. And that, that's, how, that's how we compute the reasonable point. So in the end, after learning, non-zero coordinates in the, in the alpha separator are going to be the reasonable point. Okay, I hope it's all clear, and now we're going to move up to our actual uh, contribution. Uh, the idea is to actually somewhat optimize that definition, uh, so learn a similarity function so that it fulfills this definition. Um, and of course, there's two motivation, uh, motivations for this. The first one is that the definition gives us a natural objective that we can optimize, which is that of the definition. And we know that if we satisfy this, then we'll be able to have a low error classifier. So that's, that's quite a nice thing to have. And second motivation is that uh, most similarity function for structured data, so if we're talking about strings, trees, graphs, mm, a lot of them are not uh, PSD, positive semi-definite, and therefore they're not believed kernels, and you, can use, you can't use them directly in SVM. I know there's tricks around there to, to do it anyway, but well, it's, it just seems to us that this is a well-suited framework for uh, for those uh, non-PSD similarities. So in this uh, particular work, we're going to focus on the string edit distance. That's what we're going to try to optimize. Uh, so the string uh, edit distance, or Levenstein edit distance, between two strings, x and y, is the minimum number of operations to turn, uh, to turn x into y. And the allowable operations are insertion, deletion, and substitution of symbols. So we have a quick example here. Uh, so the, the 
the, the distance between ABB and AA uh, is two because you need at least two operations to go from one to another, such as uh, substituting a, e, a B with an A and uh, delaying a B. <coughs> and you can also um, define a more general uh, version, EC, when, where you use a cost for, for this operation. So you have basically a cost matrix here that defines a cost for each operation. And now we can, you can use this cost to find the cheapest uh, sequence of operation to get from one string to another. And of course, it might change the operation you use uh, from this case to this one, depending on the actual cost. Okay, so we're going to try to optimize this cost. That's what we're going to try, uh, be trying to do. And there exists a decent amount of literature on learning edit costs or edit probabilities in some cases. Um, but they all share the same drawbacks, essentially. And the first one is that they usually are iterative procedures. Um, and that can be, <laughs> that, that can be costly, uh, especially because computing the edit distance between long strings uh, is costly, so if you have to do it several times because it's iterative, or you lose time. Second one is that they usually make use of only positive pairs, that is, pairs of the same label, trying to move them closer together, and they don't really use negative pairs. So we would like to be able to use negative pairs as well. And above all, they're not learned to be epsilon gamma to good, of course. So um, usually you you optimize some quantities that could be maximum likelihood or something like that, um, which isn't theoret theoretically linked to your the performance of your class classifier. So essentially, you learn your similarity function, and you hope that it's going to improve the classifier, but you don't know it for sure. Um, we want some theoretical guarantee that our similarity function is going to perform well. So we're going to our method is going to address these uh, three issues. Um, so the first one is that iterative approach uh, problem. And this is because what I explained a bit earlier, that the, uh, the optimal script, the best sequence of operation, uh, depends on the cost themselves. Um, uh, that's why you have to recompute the, the, the distance when you, change it, when you change the cost. And in our case, um, we're going to just define a a simpler um, edit similarity function, e.g., where we'll take the, the sequence of operation of the standard edit distance, the one with where the costs are all one, and only after that we'll apply uh, specific costs to those operations. So now our edit script is not going to change, we're just going to tweak the costs. And we'll optimize uh, this kg. Uh, this is just a bit different to make sure it's and minus one one as required by the definition. Uh, now the next problem is that to optimize the goodness of, uh, of a similarity um, presents two, um, two difficulties. And the first one is that if you optimize directly, uh, you, uh, you get a non-convex um, optimization problem. That's, uh, that's not good. And also we do, we do not know the set of reasonable points <coughs> in advance because here, we, we get it when, when we learn the classifier, but here we are, before that, we're trying to learn the similarity itself. Um, so the solution to the first issue is that we're just going to optimize a criterion that bounds uh, the one of the definition. And essentially, while in the definition you're trying to average over the similarities to, uh, with respect to the reasonable points, here we just require it to be true <coughs> with respect to each reasonable point individually. So that's a stricter condition, but if we know that if we satisfy this, we satisfy the definition. And the second issue is just um, uh, so the, the, the fact that we don't have the reasonable points in advance. And we know that taking all points as reasonable is probably not a good idea, because we're going to have an over-constraint problem. And if we think about it, we can see reasonable points as being some good representatives of subset of the data. So keeping that idea in mind, we uh, model this by introducing an indicator matching function, uh, Fn, that associates uh, to each training example uh, NL examples uh, from the training sample. Um, and how did we do this in the experiment? We just matched each, each example to its p nearest neighbors 
of the same class and to its p farthest neighbors of, uh, of the opposite class using the standard edit distance. Okay, so we have to keep in mind that so we're trying to move closer a pairs of the same class and further away to those of opposite class. And this is the convex formulation we could come up with. Um, and it's essentially, as I said, optimizing the definition more or less where we are trying to minimize here the margin violations, which we separate into cases. When the pairs of examples are of a different class, we want, it, we want the distance to be greater than some variable v1. And when they're of the same class, you want them to be <coughs> smaller than some other variable v2. And then you have v2 minus v1 minus v2, which is your margin, pretty much, uh, that you can set as a parameter, like the desired margin you want uh, in your particular problem. And the other parameter is the regularization on the edit cost. So we optimize this and we get some edit costs that um, hopefully you end up with a similarity that respects the definition. And so but we, as I said, we just don't want to hope, we want <coughs> theoretical guarantees. Um, and so what we want to do is to bound the true error on our, of our edit model by essentially uh, so bounding the expected loss over the whole distribution. And we could do this using uniform stability. Uh, uniform stability, uh, well, the, the idea behind it is, is fairly simple. It, it's about studying the impact of a small change in the training sample and see if the cumulated loss of your of the residue model changes a lot or not a lot, and the fact is, if you can if you can bound that uh, that change in the in the in the loss, then you can derive the generalization bound. So I'm not going I'm not going to go into the details of the proofs, but essentially we could prove that the algorithm has a uniform stability <coughs> in kappa over n t n t being the number of training examples, and from that we could derive a generalization bound. So bounding the true uh, loss by the empirical uh, loss over the training sample and some term that depends on nt. And what we like about that bound as well is that, it, is that it's independent from the size of the alphabet, which doesn't appear in the bound. So it should be quite robust to probably big alphabets. That's what we expect. Um, and at last, a few experiments, we just experimented over a very simple task, which was classifying words as either French or English, or English, English. and we, um, we studied three uh, different similarities. In red here, you have the standard edit distance with the coastal set to one. Um, I forgot to say that here is the number of training examples you use to run the cost, and this is the, the accuracy. So this is the baseline, then we have in blue, um, a method that is based on probabilistic models and it's running um, edit probabilities using an iterative approach based on uh, expectation maximization and it optimizes, it, it's based on maximum likelihood essentially. And after a while, we see that this method outperforms the baseline. And, okay, and our method is in green here and we can see that it both outperforms the other two similarities but also that it converges really fast, we can outperform the baseline with really few examples, like about 50, um, and, and we converge really fast as well. And um, another advantage of, of this that we notice is that when you later on build your classifiers uh, from the similarity function you have, um, it turns out that learning a similarity to make it uh, fit the definition better also um, results in uh, sparser models. So we have a model that performs better, but it's also sparser. Um, so as a quick recap, we made use of the framework of uh, Balkan to create a novel and uh, efficient way to learn string similarities. And we showed that these similarities uh, probably generalize well and that they lead to lower classifiers for the task. Um, future work could include uh, adapting a framework for tree edit cost learning. Uh, which is kind of straightforward. You can keep the same approach the same and just uh, change the string edit script in, in the method and take a tree edit script instead. And we'd like also to learn maybe other types of similarities, including numerical similarities. Thank you.
So when you did the comparisons with the EM algorithm, is that also using an L1 regularizer so that we're normalizing for the difference in the algorithm and the difference in the smoothing? Um, well, you have to, I think, differentiate two things. There is the edit cost learning procedures. Uh, so how you uh, to run the cost. And in our case, if you remember, the convex program, it's not L1 regularized. What, what is L1 regularized is how you learn the separator after that. And this is the same method for all the similarities. So it's, uh, So nice. Um, I'm a little bit puzzled on the task. The task is classifying if a word is an English or French word. Right. You can apply this on more complex tasks, like for example, uh, detect if uh, noun phrases are co-referring or not. So because the task there seem, seems a little bit simple. Yeah. So instead, of this kind of uh, uh, edit distance is exploited in NLP in many, many tasks. And then you can really understand the value of uh, your approach. Yeah, I totally agree. We, we just had this small experiment uh, going on for this paper, but we are definitely looking into more extensive things or different um, data sets. And yeah, we're looking into that. You're right that uh, we need probably more experiments to be sure. Okay, since we have the fifth talk as well, so let's rush into it and then we'll